Let's talk a little bit about sea level rise and what better place to do it than here in the Maldives in the Indian Ocean where the threat truly is existential. Before I begin, I want to emphasize that sea level rise is just one of the effects of climate change and it possibly isn't even the most destructive one. In fact, I don't think it is. There's so much to talk about with climate change. We're not going to cover it all here, but when we talk about forest fires and floods and superstorms and erosion and just heat related deaths and um, particularly the changing ocean currents, which are the least predictable part of it and will change rainfall patterns across the globe. They're huge in combination. So we're just talking about one aspect, sea level rise today. So the first question is, has it risen? And the answer is, yes, it has very much. And we've got great data to show that. So over the past 100 years, we've increased the temperature of this planet uh, by just over a degree Celsius. And in that time, we've increased the sea level because of that change by about 20 centimeters already. So give or take a few centimeters, we've got about 20 centimeters. So it's definitely happening. We've got good historical data. So the next question is, what's coming? And let's make a few predictions about that. What's probable and what's possible in the next 25 years, and then we'll go through to 2100. So this is what 20 centimeters extra sea level rise looks like. And we are guaranteed that. That is baked into our future between now and 2050. That is the absolute minimum if we are super, super aggressive on our emissions cuts. That's considered the baseline for any scenario you can possibly imagine. Because the greenhouse gas is already up there, the warming's already happening, and it doesn't come out easily or quickly. That's baked in to our future to 2050. 44 centimeters, just around my knee. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we're talking about for 2100 as the absolute minimum scenario baked into our future. The problem with these minimum scenarios is they all assume we're going to stop before two degrees. And I've looked at this every which way from Sunday and we are definitely going to crash through two degrees in terms of anthropogenic heating on this planet. So they're not realistic. They're the absolute minimums, but not realistic. On top of that, every time we measure the speed of melting of the ice caps and the Greenland ice sheets and all these feedback loops, these reinforcing effects, which are accelerating the pace of uh, sea level rise, the data come in worse than we project. So when we look at the 2100 scenario, most scientists are looking now around 1 to 1.6 meters in terms of increased, uh, increased uh, height of sea level. So my predictions as an absolute minimum, if we're very, very aggressive on our emissions cuts, and we will be greater than two degrees in terms of the atmospheric temperature, my predictions are more like by 2050, 30 centimeters global average increase. And by 2100, about a meter, which looks like this. So that's if we're super, super aggressive on making our emissions cuts. Of course, there are choices. If we choose not to be super aggressive and we end up with a three degree scenario or worse, then all bets are off. Now, here's the thing. That's sort of the forecast for 2050 and 2100. But let's talk about inertia. Because one of the big problems and one of the things that really scares scientists is that the ice takes time to melt. So if we go back before this last stable period of 3,000 years, before our last 100 years, if we look at the last time the Earth warmed by about four degrees, the ice took another 8,000 years to catch up. So it kept on melting. Because we know it doesn't happen instantaneously. It takes time. And it added another 45 meters of sea level height 
back then. Now, we don't have that much ice to melt now, so we're not looking at 45 meters, but we are guaranteed to have multiple meters of sea level rise, by which I mean over my head. So at least two to three meters. It could be as low as that, there's a lot of uncertainty here, or it could be a lot higher. But at least a couple of meters of sea level rise. That gets profoundly scary, but because it's past 2100, it's so easy for so many people to put it off. But that's locked in. We're definitely getting that. And I won't even get into the three and four degree scenarios long term because they are truly scary. It's enough to know the two levels that I set there, I think, in the water. So what are the consequences of this? What does this mean for our future? What are the implications of this? And I started by saying, here we are in the Maldives. So here we have a perfect example of what's to come in so many places in the world. Now, firstly, a lot of people think the Maldives is just beautiful beaches like we're standing on today, but that's not the case. The Maldives is best exemplified by the capital, Ma Le, because it's a big city. As you'll see in these images, it's like any other city with all of the infrastructure. And out of the half million people that populate the Maldives, 220,000 of them live just there in eight square kilometers. They're already suffering lots of erosion. Now that's interesting, on the outer islands, it's complex. Sometimes we get deposits of new sand, so as the sea level rises, we're finding, and there's great data supporting this, that some of the islands are just changing shape. They're evolving, which is problematic, but not necessarily catastrophic. But back in Male, they don't have that option. The streets are paved, the buildings are built. You can't jack up the entire city by a couple of feet every few decades. You don't have that option. So every time there's a big storm, you now have threats of flooding and that sort of thing. They have a loss of fresh groundwater because of rising uh, uh, salinity, rising water levels uh, underneath the islands. So they've got to manufacture through desalination a lot of their fresh water, almost all of it, in fact. They're devoting a great deal of the national budget to infrastructure prepare and also disaster mitigation. So there's this huge financial burden already on the Maldives. And when we drill into those costs, you know, it's sea walls, it's ports, it's uh, looking after the airport, it's uh, protecting everything after the flood, it's all that sort of stuff. And they're setting aside funds. So a lot of their tourist dollars are going to separate funds because they know that at some stage they have to fund controlled migration away from their home. So as the real estate becomes untenable in Male and everywhere else, they have to move. They're going to lose their home. They're going to lose every aspect of their life here and all the history that goes with that. So mass migration is the final outcome. Every other ocean atoll, which has a similar average height, sort of one to one and a half meters above sea level, is threatened in the Pacific, in the Caribbean, and elsewhere in the world. Then we have real catastrophe in many countries in Asia. I would single out Bangladesh, the Philippines, Indonesia, and there are a bunch of others that will suffer very greatly. You take Bangladesh, they're going to lose a large proportion of their arable land as they get coastal squeeze from just small rises in sea level because it's so low lying. And then, of course, the other one that's going to suffer all the same things as we're seeing here in different degrees will be the United States. Um, the eastern seaboard of the United States is already suffering erosion problems and other issues, repeat inundations, look at Miami and other parts of the country, and you see those repeat inundations coming thicker and faster. So now we have to spend lots of money and allocate more of the state budget and the federal budgets towards mitigation and infrastructure uh, development and saving it and improving it. And again, the same things are happening and will happen to a great degree there with groundwater. Very few people talk about groundwater rise in the US, but it's huge. It doesn't matter what sea walls you build, the groundwater will rise. So we have huge infrastructure costs associated with that. And ultimately, we have a lot of untenable real estate. Now, a great metaphor for this 
if you want one, is Fort Myers Beach. We were there recently, and I was there a couple of years ago, um, before Hurricane Ian hit, so I can compare the two. And one of the things you see when you visit is how much of the real estate is still destroyed because people are unsure about buying it or redeveloping it. It's not anymore a no-brainer to go and redevelop a community which has had a storm plus a bit of sea level rise come through it. When you think about real estate and the impacts, one impact is the repeat inundations and the groundwater and all the other things. That's a particular date when you've been replacing that drywall and the carpets and the timbers and the appliances often enough that it's just not worth keeping that real estate. But before that date, there's another date. And that's the date when everyone else realizes the second date's coming. And that's when your real estate valuation gets cut in half. And that's a lot earlier. So that's kind of the future as we look at the eastern seaboard. And it's particularly nasty, of course, in Florida and uh, all the low-lying areas there. I've driven the length of the US East Coast from Key West to the upper reaches of Maine. And all of it, all of it will suffer. It doesn't matter what state you're in, what political party you vote for, whether you believe in climate change or not, the physics will not change. So there's a look into our future. And even that 30 centimeters to sort of up to a meter scenario, the 2100 is going to make massive differences along that coastline. So what can we do about it? Everything we're already doing, but faster. We already know all the answers. We've got all the technologies. Transition to the clean electrification technologies of solar and wind as fast as we possibly can, as individuals, as communities, as cities, as countries. We need to do it faster. And luckily the economics are on our side. Those things are accelerating exponentially, that's helpful. We need good policy that supports an even economic playing field through that transition. So one of the easiest things we can do is look at the many hundreds of trillions of dollars that are facing us with this one issue and all the other issues that I mentioned at the beginning about climate change. Add them up and price in just a little fraction of that into fossil fuels and other energy sources. And just pricing in a little fraction of that cost, which is so much greater than the expenditure of the transition, will accelerate it vastly. So vote accordingly, choose your leaders on that basis, price in some of that carbon just a little bit, and you'll see that transition accelerate dramatically.